Today we're going to talk about still applying Mendel's principles, but now we're going to go a little bit deeper and continue with some dihybrid problems today. So the question today is how do alleles segregate when more than one gene is involved? Remember that an allele is simply the different forms of the gene. So here's one allele and this would be the other. The principle of independent assortment states that genes for different traits can segregate or separate independently during the formation of gametes. And remember gametes are egg and sperm cells. So what Mendel wondered was if the segregation of one pair of alleles affected another pair. So in other words, were certain traits passed together? Mendel performed an experiment that followed two different genes as they passed from one generation to the next. So when we're talking about genes, in this case, he's trying to cross more than one trait at a time and watching what happens from one generation to the next. Because it involves two different genes, Mendel's experiment is known as a two-factor or dihybrid cross. Single gene crosses, remember, were called monohybrid crosses. So what Mendel decided to do, he crossed some true breeding plants that produced only round and yellow peas with plants that produced wrinkled green peas. So he crossed a completely dominant plant for two traits with a completely recessive plant for two traits. The round and yellow peas had the genotype of big R, big R, because they were homozygous dominant, and big Y, big Y, because they were homozygous dominant for color as well. And the wrinkled peas that were green had the complete opposite. They were little r, little r, because they were showing the wrinkled recessive trait, and little y, little y, because they were showing the green recessive trait. What ended up happening was that every single one of his offspring were round and yellow. What that showed was that the alleles for yellow and round peas were dominant over the alleles for green and wrinkled. So the Punnett square here shows that the genotype of each offspring was a mixture of the two parents. Each one was big R, little r, big Y, little y, which means they were heterozygous for both seed shape and seed color. So Mendel then crossed the F1 generation to get the F2 generation. What Mendel saw at this point was that he had 315 of this F2 generation that had seeds that were round and yellow, and then he ended up with 32 seeds that were wrinkled and green. But 209 of the seeds had combinations of phenotypes and therefore combinations of alleles that were not found in either parent. For example, he had some that were wrinkled and yellow when neither of the parents were wrinkled and yellow at the same time. So what Mendel sort of discovered here was that the alleles for seed shape segregated independently of those for seed color. So it didn't matter that both of his parents were round and yellow. He was actually able to get some of those recessive traits coming through whenever he crossed those parents. Genes that segregate independently, such as the genes for seed shape and seed color, do not influence each other's inheritance. In other words, acquiring one of those traits does not mean you inherit the other. Mendel's experimental results were really close to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that's shown here in this Punnett square. Mendel had discovered the principle of independent assortment. This principle basically states that genes for different traits can segregate independently during gamete formation. In other words, just because you inherit one trait does not necessarily mean that another is coming with it. All right, let's complete a dihybrid Punnett square example together. I know this is not in your notes, but you are expected to do one on your test, and there are some questions that go along here in this ed puzzle. In this example, we're going to cross two pea plants that are heterozygous for size and pod color. You're actually already given the parent genotypes. What you need to then do is fill out the legend and tell me what each letter stands for. So using the same rules that we did in our monohybrids, we have a capital T is what we're going to use for the tall plant, 
A lowercase t is what we're using for the short. A capital G is for green, and a lowercase g is for yellow. So then you need to rewrite your parent genotypes. And next, what you're gonna have to do is figure out what are all the possibilities for the gametes for the parents. What I like to do is to FOIL. So if any of you remember or have heard of the term FOIL, it means first, outer, inner, and last. So I actually use these letters just like you would use numbers in math to help me make sure I get all the gamete combinations. Let me show you how I do this. So the first thing I do is set them up kind of like you would a math problem and I'm going to take the first of each letter in order to figure out my gametes. So I'm going to take a capital T and a big G and I'm going to write those right here. Next, I'm going to take the outer of each letter, so a capital T and a lowercase g. Next, I'm going to take the inner of each letter, so I'm going to have a lowercase t and a capital G. And then finally, I'm going to take the last of each letter, which is a lowercase t and a lowercase g. So previously, you were told to always put the capital letter first, but that's specifically for a monohybrid. When you're working on dihybrids, whatever letter alleles you choose to go first need to remain first, or you'll end up confusing yourself. So even though this T right here is lowercase and the G is capital, I've already written it out for my T's to go first and it needs to remain that way. Now I'm gonna do the same thing for the next parent. I'm gonna take the first of each letter, so big T, big G, the outer of each letter, so big T, little g, the inner of each letter, little t, big G, and finally, the last of each letter. This gives me all of the possible gamete combinations. So remember that parents can only copy and give away half of their genes or half of their alleles. And so I have to find out what are all of the possible combinations before I can try to make a Punnett square to predict what's gonna happen in their offspring. So now that I have the gamete possibilities for my parent, I'm gonna take those and stick them into this Punnett square. Now that you have the gamete possibilities for each parent in your Punnett square, you're ready to actually complete the cross. So let's do a couple of boxes here together and then I'm gonna pause this and fill it out for you. So first, what we're gonna end up having, what we have to end up doing here is putting together our letters again. Remember, our parents had their T's together and their G's together. So we have to do the same thing for our offspring. So all we're gonna do is take down the capital T from the top and the capital T from the side and then we're gonna add in our G's. So you wanna keep the T's together and the G's together. Now let's continue on to the next one. We're gonna do capital T, capital T, and at this point, now that we're putting our letters back together, if a capital is there, we wanna kinda of stick it back in front of that lowercase letter it belongs with. And then we continue on down the line. And I'm going to go ahead and fill out the rest for you. Now that we're finished, we're ready to actually get some information out of this. So here we have our completed Punnett square. And now we have to get details. So this time, if you count up the number of boxes, you have 16 possible boxes. So your answer, your ratio here, is going to be out of 16. And then all we're really looking for are phenotypic ratios. So we're looking for... First off, the plants that are tall with green pods. And so what we're looking for is any square that has a capital T and a capital G. Now, because we're only dealing with phenotypes, it doesn't really matter what goes next to those T's or G's. If it has a capital T, we know it's gonna be a tall plant. And if it has a capital G, we know it's gonna be a green plant. So usually what I do is I go through the boxes and I make a little mark if I count that box, just so later I don't get confused. So I'm looking for capital T's and capital G's together. So there's one and two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we're gonna have a nine 
out of 16. Then we're going to go look for plants that will end up possibly being tall with yellow pods. And the only way to show yellow pods is to have two recessive alleles. So the two little g's. So I'm going to go through and do the same thing. I don't have to count the boxes with the dots in them because I already counted for something else. So capital T with two lowercase g's. I have a one, a two, and I have three. So I'm going to have three, possibility of three out of 16 of those. Then we go to short with green. So the only way to have short are two lowercase t's. And then green is anything with a big G. So we're going to go looking for those. So we have two lowercase t's and a big G here. That's one. And then two. And then three. And now I'm looking for something that is completely recessive, which means it's short and it has yellow pods. That's little t, little t, little g, little g. And I have one of those. So this gives us that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that usually occurs, uh, well, does happen whenever you cross two hybrid plants for two hybrid traits. So what has Mendel taught us? Um, Mendel contributed to our understanding of genetics by really explaining some basic principles of heredity, things that were observed through patterns he saw, and it really formed the basis of modern genetics. The inheritance of biological characteristics is determined by your individual unit, which we call genes. And these are passed from parents to offspring. Where two or more forms of the gene for a single trait exist, some forms of the gene can be dominant and others can be recessive. So the principle of dominance and recessiveness really comes from all of the work that Mendel did. In most sexually reproducing organisms, each adult is going to have two copies of the gene because each adult had two parents, came from one from each parent, and these genes will actually segregate independently of one another. They, they do not travel together when the gametes are formed. Alleles for different genes usually segregate independently of one another. And then we start to go a little further. So we know that Mendel studied his work on plants, but at the beginning of the 1900s, there was a geneticist named Thomas Hunt Morgan, and he decided to see if a bunch of Mendel's principles actually applied to animals as well. So he used a fruit fly. It was a very ideal organism because like Mendel's plants, it was relatively simple and it could produce a lot of offspring in a short amount of time and didn't really have a problem with doing that in a laboratory. Before long, what Morgan and the other biologists um, ended up discovering is that they were able to test every one of Mendel's principles, and they were able to apply that not just to plants, but also to other organisms. The basic principles of Mendelian genetics can be used to study the inheritance of some human traits and even calculate the probability of those traits appearing in the next generation.